In this video, we'll go into a little bit more detail about how caches are organized. We'll also talk about the problem with writing to the cache and what cache coherency is all about. With main memory, we have a sequence of bytes and the memory stores the bytes, but the addresses are not stored. The addresses are implicit. I indicate that in my drawing of memory here by showing in black all the bytes that are stored one after the other. And over here in green, I indicate the addresses uh, in hex. You can tell it's hex because there's an A and a B. And these addresses are more or less implicit. We don't have any bits of storage uh, taken up by storing the addresses. In the cache, we have a number of blocks, of cache blocks, and those cache blocks could have come from anywhere in main memory. So here's a picture of the cache, and it's sitting between main memory and the CPU. And in this particular example, my cache has only uh, four blocks in it. And each block, oh, well, in this limited example, they only contain eight bytes. Um, and the cache blocks have to somehow be labeled with addresses to show which block this, these eight bytes are. So here in this, I've outlined, or at least tried to outline, eight bytes. Okay, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And those bytes are currently the exact same bytes that are held in cache. So this block is being held in the cache memory. The bytes are still in main memory, of course. And as long as there are no writes to any of these bytes, then the values are exactly the same. We need to associate with each block some additional information to tell where these bytes are coming from. So for the entire block, we need to have the address or, uh, of where that block begins. Okay, so Here's a block of data, it comes from this area, and it's this, the eight sequential bytes that start with that address. Here's another group of eight bytes, I haven't actually drawn in the bytes, but they would, of course, be there. Um, and we have an address for it, so that's another block, and we have some other blocks as well. So the point I want to make here is that the cache has to store additional bits beyond just the data itself. And in this simplified world, it's got to at least store the address of where that block comes from. So next let's turn to the problem of writes. But before we do that, let's talk about a read. If the CPU wants to read a particular byte, then it may or may not be in the cache. If it's in the cache, of course, we call that a cache hit. And if it's not, it's a cache miss. And in the case of a cache miss, the cache needs to read the block from main memory, but in order to have some place to put it, it has to evict a block that's already in the cache. And ideally, we'd like to evict the least recently used block. And many caches can actually implement that exact strategy. So we will evict the block that was used furthest in the past with the hope that it will is the least likely to be needed again in the near future. Now what happens if the CPU wants to write to memory? Well there are again two possibilities that the cache contains the block or the cache does not contain the block. If the CPU wants to write a byte and the block containing that byte is in the cache we call that a write hit. Okay, The cache contains the data that needs to be modified. And if the cache does not contain the data, if it doesn't contain the block that has that particular byte in it, then that's a write miss. Well, let's look at the hit first. So the cache contains the block. There are two different approaches that a cache can take. Uh, one is called write through, and the other is called write back. These are design decisions that uh, are made when the cache is, is designed in the first place. And so it's not like the cache is going to some, sometimes switch midway. Uh, once it's manufactured, it's going to be either a write-through cache or a write-back cache. 
Uh, same with the right allocate and the right no allocate. These are design decisions that are made at the uh, point the cache is designed and manufactured. With write through, okay, the cache contains the block that's getting updated. What happens th here is that the cache unit will immediately forward the update to main memory. So the cache will write the modified block with the modified data back to main memory immediately. It won't wait. On the other hand, with, cache, with write back, the cache will wait. So what happens is it updates the data that's stored in cache, right? The, the cache contains the block that's being updated, so the byte in that block is updated, but the cache does not copy it back to memory. So the block that's stored in memory, the version of the block that's stored in memory, will have the old data in it. At some later time, the cache will ultimately have to write that block back to memory. And when does that occur? Well, it occurs when that block is evicted. So sometime in the future, the cache will need to uh, read a new block from, from memory, and it will choose this updated block to write back to, to evict, and it will have to write it back to memory. It can't just discard it. If the block has been updated, it needs to be written back to memory. Now, if the write is to a block that's not in the cache, if the cache doesn't contain the block, then there are two choices called write allocate and write no allocate. So, with write allocate, the idea is the cache will read the block from memory and put it into the cache and then update the copy that's in the cache. It will update the block as it's stored in the cache. With write no allocate, you know, sometimes called no write allocate, um, the cache will not load the block into the cache memory, but instead it will just forward the write right on through the cache to the memory. So we'll, it will update the data in memory, but it will not copy that block into the cache. Which of these strategies do caches actually use? Well, typically they do this. On a write hit, they use write back. And on a write miss, they use write allocate. Okay, although the other alternative sometimes happens. So, when there is a write hit, in other words, the CPU wants to update a byte and that byte belongs to a block that's already loaded into the cache, then it updates the copy in the cache, but it doesn't immediately notify the memory that that cache block has changed. So it doesn't copy that update through to the memory. Instead, it saves it until later Okay, when the cache, when the block is evicted. And when a block is evicted from cache, if it's been updated, it has to be written back to main memory. But if it hasn't been updated, there's no need to write it back to main memory, and that would just waste a bunch of time. So the cache also maintains what's called a dirty bit for each block. So this is a one-bit flag that's associated with each block in the cache. Each block has a bit called this dirty bit, and it's either one or a zero, or you know, one indicates that it's dirty, that is that the block has been modified. In other words, there's been a write to some byte within the block. That block is no longer uh, a virgin, it's now dirty, so to speak, and it has to be written back to main memory. If the dirty bit is zero, then the block has not been modified, and uh, it does not need to be written back to main memory. Okay, so we can save the time uh, of that would be wasted writing it back to memory. Okay, and coupled with this, it's typical to use write allocate for a write miss. So if the CPU tries to modify a byte that's but that byte belongs to a block that's not in the cache then what the cache will do is it will allocate. Okay, in other words, it will 
load the block into cache. Obviously, it has to evict some other block, but after it does that, it loads the block into the cache, and then it can perform the write, and it performs the write on the cache version of the block. Okay, it doesn't uh, update memory immediately. It doesn't let memory know. It does not write through. Um, so uh, it has to set the dirty bit to indicate that that cache block has been modified. And it doesn't immediately update memory. Instead, it waits until the block has to be evicted. And this is a pretty good strategy, particularly if uh, there are more writes to this block. And we know from the principle of locality that if, if this block is touched, it's likely to be touched again. And, and so if it's written to, it's likely that this uh, block will be written to again. And since it's already in memory, uh, that's a good thing. So this is what's typically used uh, on a write hit. We use write back. Okay, in other words, we, we, we don't write back immediately. We wait. Uh, we set the dirty bit and, and do it later. And on write miss, we move that block into the cache um, and set the dirty bit. And then uh, later we update memory. There's another approach, though, that's also used, and that is uh, to write through. So when the cache um, contains the block, it's typical just to go ahead and modify the memory. Um, and likewise, it tends to, these two tend to go together, that uh, when there's a write miss, we're trying to update a byte that's in a block that's not cached, um, the cache will just forward the write request on through to the memory and not bother to allocate uh, a block of the cache to that. So the write is just passed through. Um, by the way, the first strategy tends to keep updates in the cache without notifying the memory immediately. So the memory may be somewhat out of date. Whereas with the second strategy, memory is notified as soon as possible and so memory is not uh, out of date. The data in memory is uh, reflecting the writes that have occurred. In a computer situation where you have uh, shared memory, where you have multiple CPUs and they are sharing memory, uh, there can sometimes be problems if there are inconsistencies. For example, if one CPU tries to write a byte of memory and that byte is not updated in memory, it's only updated in the cache, another CPU might try to read that byte and see an old version of the data. So the write through, no write allocate strategy might make more sense, might be necessary in a system where you have several CPUs sharing main memory. On the other hand, there are other better ways to synchronize between multiple processors um, so this may not really be uh, a valid reason to use these strategies. Now let's take a look at what a cache line is. In this example, I'm going to assume that our ca cache blocks are 8 bytes in length, not uh, 64 bytes, but only 8 bytes, just to make this a little bit more manageable. And let's assume that our addresses are 32 bits. In length. So each address has 32 bits and the address of a block will always end in three zeros. Okay, we, we will assume that blocks are aligned so every 8 byte aligned block of data will have an address that ends in three zeros and the individual bytes within that block would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. In other words, in binary 0, 0, 0 through 1, 1, 1. So the block address will end in 3 bits because the block size in this example is 8 bytes. If the block size were larger, it would be more bits. If the block size were, for example, 16 bytes, then the last four bits would be zero. If the block size was 64 bytes, then the last six 
bits would be zero. But in our example, it's just the last three bits because blocks are eight bytes. So this cache, this is a cache line here. Okay, it's said to be eight bytes in size, although we've got additional information about uh, which block it is, as well as some bits. You see here I've got a dirty bit. So the cache line contains the eight bytes of actual data that came out of memory. And so here we have in hex eight bytes of data. So the, this is the byte that's at the beginning of the block and the next byte and the next byte and so on. So we have the eight bytes from memory. So this is a chunk, a sequence of eight bytes in order out of the main memory. And where do they come from? Well, that's the address of the block itself. So in this case, looking at this bit pattern in hex, we have A, C, A, C, B, 9, B9, 35, 35, and 98. Okay. And so you can see that the last three bits are zero because the last hex digit is eight. So uh, we might not actually need to store those last three bits because they must always be zero. So we might actually only store 29 bits and not all 32 bits. Uh, so in any case, we have the address of the block and then the addresses of the bytes within that block are implicit. We don't need to store anything there. We've also got the dirty bit. Bits are either one or zero and one value indicates that the block is dirty, that is that it's been modified and we need to write it back to memory at some future time. And the other value of the bit indicates that it has never been modified and so we don't need to write it back. I'm also showing another bit called the valid bit. Is this line full of data? In certain situations we need to um, know whether uh, these bytes are valid or not. For example, when the computer first powers up, um, all of the memory will have values, uh, random unpredictable values to be sure, so we don't uh, can't rely on those values. So by setting the valid bit to indicate this is not a valid line of data, not a valid block of data, uh, we can avoid uh, using it and force the system to load the block from memory. These valid bits are also used when there's a context switch and we switch from one address space to another. That's beyond the scope of this talk, but uh, when we go, f when the operating system moves from one thread or from one process to another uh, thread or another process, there's a different address space. And so the contents of the cache apply to one process and not to another process. So uh, because of virtual memory, uh, these addresses are all messed up. And so the solution is just to set all the bits uh, all the valid bits to zero to indicate that none of the cache is valid. Then as the process starts up, the cache is said to be cold, okay, meaning it doesn't contain any useful data at all. A cold cache contains no useful data and we can make the cache cold by setting all the valid bits to indicate that every cache block is invalid. And when the process starts up, uh, immediately we'll have a lot of cache misses and so initially we'll have to load blocks of data from the memory into the cache uh, but once the cache is warmed up uh, and full of good useful data uh, then the program can proceed so warming the cache up basically gets the working set into the cache so that the program can then run at full speed with a much lower miss ratio